over the years, we've had uh, expressions of interest in a program on quilting. Uh, and uh, I, I, I assumed everybody was interested in quilting. I grew up in a family where my grandmother Hunt had seven sisters and all the eight sisters quilted most of the time. If they weren't quilting, they were making rag rugs out of the worn out clothing in the family. Uh, <clears throat> my much younger sister, the tennis pro, uh, won uh, the award for most artistic student when she graduated from Bartram uh, some years ago for the quilt that she made, which had panels depicting her then young family history. Uh, so that's a tradition that, that continued in my family. Um, and um, in the new Smithsonian Magazine that arrived this week, uh, there's uh, uh, an article about the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston uh, has a new show opening with 58 quilts and bed covers spanning 400 years of US history. And the point is made that quilts bear witness. Uh, I liked that phrase very much because they do bear witness in many families. Uh, and of course, the variety of quilts uh, available today is, is astonishing. Uh, I remember the first time I saw the quilts from Guy's Bend uh, at a museum in Washington. I think the first uh, uh, exhibit of their quilts was at the Whitney in New York, but I saw it when it moved on to Washington. And in a later presentation, uh, Amy is going to uh, show her quilts. And they were directly inspired by that first quilt show at the Whitney. She and her mother uh, saw that show and that inspired her quilt making. Uh, there will also be a, a visit to um, Dudley Farm where you will be able to see uh, the quilt frame that drops down from the, the guest room uh, for the quilters there. They have a very active quilting group at Dudley Farm. And uh, Julianne took her camera out and uh, did that presentation. So I think that, uh, that there are going to be a lot of interesting uh, opportunities during these uh, six weeks. And, and the collection, yes, uh, at Dudley Farm. Um, so uh, with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dick. Uh, I am going to leave a little early because I have an emergency dental appointment at 11. Uh, but uh, again, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to this program. I think it's a, a, another dimension by ILR. Thank you. The first two sessions for this quilting across America will be conducted by persons from Oak Hammock. Today, we will have several Oak Hammock quilters. Uh, next week, Sally Doyes will have the entire session and that will be amazing and you will, and you will love it. Um, when, when we talked about how to present this, uh, several of the quilters got together and decided that we could do it best by doing it by film so that we could show you some of these spectacular quilts so it would be colorful. And we could also hear the stories of how they were done. And most of all, tell the story of the lap quilts that go to skilled nursing. Because I, I think, I, I have no data to support this, but I, I doubt that there's any other uh, retirement community such as ours that has had a volunteer project uh, that has produced the quantity and the quality of gifts to every person who goes into skilled nursing. And so, Roy, thank you for a chance to highlight that uh, because we need to know about it. And 
uh, others need to know about it as well. So we just kind of put together a little team who volunteered to, to be interviewed and to talk about their quilts. We uh, started with Ann Carlson Bonus and Pat Martin because they were, they were the two who started the lap quilt program. Then we asked two fairly new residents, Janet Bostrom and uh, Marilyn Crosby to share their stories about quilting. Um, Marilyn Hutchinson, who resides in assisted living is in this video and we wanted to illustrate the fact that wherever you, wherever you live, uh, you can keep on quilting. Uh, Brenda Thomas, who started her quilting career at the young age of 95 and for the past four years has made one quilt every month. So you can, you can do the math. And then we have Vanda O'Neill who just does a variety of, of styles of quilting. So that's the content of the video. Um, we, uh, we, we must recognize and, and thank uh, Mary Sue Keppel, who is the interviewer. Uh, she's the person in the shadows. You never see her, but you hear her, you hear her questions, <clears throat> and she keeps everything moving along. Not only that, she was a full partner in the editing process, putting this all together, because we ended up having seven interviews, uh, most of them about 30 minutes. And so we had to take all of that <clears throat> and bring it down to a manageable size. It's actually less than 50 minutes, the video that you're going to see. So many, many thanks to Mary Sue. Okay, and as they say, let's go on with the show. As I'm getting ready to share the screen, you all know we couldn't do anything without Dick Martin. We had the opportunity from Roy and we have the talent from our quilters, but the mastermind. Thank you, Dick Martin. <laughs> When I came to Oak Hammock in 2007, I... One moment, please. Orphans. When I came to Oak Hammock in 2007, I had a big box of orphans. I had been in a quilting group in Miami, and when we finished a quilt, we would take our pieces that were left over and cut them into five inch squares and share them. And I had maybe close to a thousand orphans I rode them around in the back of my car because I didn't know what else to do with them. And then I met this nice lady named Pat Martin. 
And Pat and I got together and decided that we would take these orphans and we would begin making lap quilts for the health pavilion. And thus the beginning of our lap quilts. The lap quilts are a project from Okama Quilters and we make the small quilts that go to the health pavilion. And those are gifts to any person who's in skilled nursing. Um, they're not large, as you can see, and part of that is sometimes the person might be in a wheelchair and this fits comfortably over a lap. Or it gives them a little bit of color and comfort in a rather sterile room. And they put it over the top of their sheet, perhaps. Right. Or, or, you know, over their feet. Mm -hmm. Or if they want to, I mean, if it's something they really like, or if it has, if it should happen to have flannel on the back, they could cozy up with it. Um, or even put it over the back of a chair for color in the room. Yes, yeah. How it, it becomes their property. And they may use it however they would like to and take it home with them. The first quilt that we made was made in December 10th, 2010, and it was given to E.T. York. We, um, we had made 647 by the time we started our new book, book in 2016. And to date, we have made 1,183 quilts. How did you um, get other people to join in this whole process? of making the quilts that went down to the, the health, health pavilion. pavilion? Well, I think we just made friends and talked them into it and we would get them down there. When we got to 1,000 quilts and we had a big party and we did a challenge quilt where our group and I, I can't, there were about maybe 20 of us that worked on it. I've got a big long list here. Uh, we're all given some similar, the same fabric and we made different squares and put them together and auctioned it off. These quilts, the small ones, are made from my scraps. I have a huge scrap bag and I just have a sample of that with me today. And I'll start out with a small piece, put it on a strip and sew and keep putting pieces on the strip. The strip will end up Oh, like this. Hmm. There's a strip of the beginning of a quilt. Then I have to cut them apart because that looks like that looks like a hula skirt, and not a quilt. <laughs> well, it looks like a border to me. Well, okay, yes, a, a mantle. Piece okay, or okay. Something. yeah, but you don't want that. But you that's want not pieces. my goal. So I just cut them up into other pieces, pick out the next strip, sew, and sew. And there's no rhyme or reason except I try to avoid the same color right on top of each other. Or if I were to have the same fabric, I'll turn it over or pick another square. Like this one. This fabric has big red cherries on pink. And this fabric has a monkey. They don't exactly go together, but they're fun and they're very colorful. And so, the teddy bear next to Oh it. yeah, the teddy bears, a spider web, you name it. When you get to the right size or what you think is the right size, you take the ruler and the square and you measure. And my blocks like this are usually eight inches. So I have to find the right numbers and measure. And that's just a little bit bigger than eight inches. 
and I'm using a cutting mat and a rotary cutter, which is very sharp. It's like a pizza cutter, only sharp, and I cut off the edges. Those are scraps too small to use, even for me. <laughs> so there's a block. Mm -hmm. And I get a whole bunch of those together. And wait, here's a stack of them. These are eight inch blocks that are all cut, ready to be laid out and sewn together. They'll end up this one's a little bit fancier because it matches a little nicer than some of the pieces. But that's because I had some other squares. This one, this is a quilt top. And you'll notice if you look, you'll see the same fabric repeated. And then the random scrap pieces alternate. And these are smaller blocks. These I think are six inches to start. So this wasn't going to be big enough for a lap quilt for us to use for the health pavilion. So I added some borders. But it's not finished. It's not a quilt. You can see all the raw seams on the inside. So what I have to have, I have to have a backing. The backing is just what it sounds like. It's a piece of fabric the same size as the top and it will be the back. But it's still not a quilt because it doesn't have any inside. And I didn't bring a piece of batting with me. A piece of batting is the fluffy inside. You cut a piece of batting the same size, you put it in the middle and sew it all up. And then do the fancy stitch work on the top. Pat, different people who make quilts have different ways of approaching the process. Why don't you tell us what your process is? Uh, there are just a lot of different ways that you can do quilts. And, and I'll show you one that I'm working on. The first thing I do is decide what kind of quilt I'm going to make. This will be a pieced quilt, meaning geometric pieces sewn together in a planned design. The next decision is the color. So then I go to my stash. I select colors which will complement each other. So I must be sure I have enough of each color to finish the quilt. Otherwise, I get almost to the end and discover that I don't have enough fabric in one of the colors, so, uh, oh, well, I have to go shopping again. Next, I cut out all the squares, triangles, and rectangles and begin sewing. As long as I've been sewing, I've been taught to sew and press, sew and press. After the first quarter is finished, I check it all over to be sure that I still like a fabric and the design. Also, it makes a good guide for the other three parts of the quilt. When all four sections are completed, I'm back at my stash to select a strip of material which will separate the quadrants. This is so-called sashing and can be whatever size I want it to be. If a quilt needs to be bigger, I make the border wider or even add a second one. But uh, that may, might mean another shopping trip. <laughs> Too bad. A piece of fabric called the backing is spread out with no lumps, wrinkles, or folds. And it's covered with a layer of batting, which is also smooth and flat. The quilt top goes onto the batting. The three layers are pinned together about five or six inches apart with safety pins from top to bottom and side to side. Now it's ready for the quilting in the ditch. 
which means sewing through all layers on the seams in which the, the quilt was put together. The binding is sewn around the outside perimeter of the quilt to cover up the raw edges and the qu lap quilt is finished just like this. It is wonderful to know that you finished your first lap quilt on August 10th, 2017 at age 95. And since then, you've done a little more than one quilt a month, and that's been going on for four years for a total now of 51 quilts. Yeah. But you mentioned... I have three more coming up that I haven't taken down and registered in the book yet. So really, you've done 54 lab yeah. quilts so far at Okamak. Yeah. Now tell me, tell us, why are you interested and why do you enjoy quilting? Well, I've enjoyed watching people quilt for years. We had a place up in North Carolina in Waynesville and a friend took me to the uh, shady lady quilters uh -huh. and they apparently were quite famous and they did a lot of shows and they met in this little mm -hmm. church once a week the shady ladies shady, in a church yeah <laughs> <laughs> thing and it was seemed to be such fun and i was able to do it at first with just these five inch squares Oops. and so there are lots of different ones you know in the drawer and you can go through it and find pieces you like. And uh, usually I, I go for the bright ones. <laughs> and I love the cats. I found the cats. And uh -huh. one, somebody had brought in cats, and they were all together. So I've got cats on me. Well, I moved in in the middle of the pandemic. So everything was closed. There were no clubs. But I saw the sewing room, and it reminded me of my high school home ec class. <laughs> so I looked around in there and Pat Liston, who's there a lot, showed me around, showed me all the different things, including the quilt. So I thought, well, I did it before, I could do it again. So I made this quilt, this was the first one. Oh good, let's look at it. It was so nice here that they have all the fabrics. So I didn't have to buy anything, it was all there. And so this is the first one I made. I think it's someone's tablecloth. So this went over to skilled nursing. And it came back? Yes. <laughs> That's nice, the way they recycle. Yes. Do you find doing quilting fun? Yeah, right. <laughs> you talked about you make a mess and then... Well, uh, I make a mess in the sewing room and in my dining room. I put everything usually, when I'm trying to figure out what, what to put together, I put it on my dining room in, in the apartment. And I put a bunch of squares together, and I look at it and I think, yeah, that's pretty good. Then I go to bed and the next morning I take another look at it, 
and I decided no. <laughs> so I start all over again. That's basically the way. But it's kind of fun to do that. That's your process. Yeah. It's my project, and it keeps me busy. And forget your aches and pains when you're working on something like this. You said once that you do quilting because if you didn't do it, you'd wither away. <laughs> exactly. You've got to keep busy. You can't just sit and do nothing. So this was a lifesaver for me. And with people like Pat Martin, who helps you with patterns, she gets hard, she gives me harder and harder patterns every time. Perfect. <laughs> but it, it's a challenge and I enjoy it. Marilyn. Yes. You said you did not care for quilting, and yet you got involved. So what's your story? Well, the story is the ladies were begging people to come and get involved in this quilt making. And they said, you don't have to be a quilter. There's other jobs for you to do. So I bid on it, and I came down here one day during their session, and I was astonished because Ann Carlson Bonus was standing here saying, so-and-so is going to be doing sandwiching here, and somebody else is going to be uh, pressing, and somebody else is going to be cutting up. And I thought, well, here we are cutting up in the sewing room, and somebody's going to be making sandwiches in the middle of you know, the cloth and all this, this is gonna be a mess. And then I realized what they were talking about, just by osmosis, I figured out that sandwiching meant layers of things in, and pressing was over there ironing the seams and straightening out the cloth. And um, the cutting, cutting up, they weren't, do, you know, cutting up and being naughty. Pat Martin was over there with her sharp instrument, slicing um, pieces of cloth into squares. And then they talked about orphans. And after having four children, I wasn't about to take on foster kids. And then I found out what they meant were these drawers full of these squares. And they said, why don't you arrange them and make, you know, for a quilt top? So that became fun for me. And I would catch myself when I'd be out for a walk, stopping by here and checking on how many orphans needed adoption. And I would end up with stacks of them to take home and make into these quilts. And arranging them in patterns is what I liked. I'm different from Vanda. She can take little pieces and make them into something that looks beautiful. I have to have a design. One of the things that interests so many of us about quilting is the strange vocabulary. <laughs> Would you tell us about some of those strange names you have for things? Well, I've got right here a sample of a few of them. And this one is called a jelly roll. A number of these things are like food, you know. <laughs> but this is a really a handy little thing all of these different colors are in here, and they are they two and a half inches wide, all of them, and they are, there are 44 in there. So you've got, if, you know, you're doing little squares or triangles or something that's two and a half, that's good. And then you've got the fat quarters that are the next thing, and they, but they'll sell them to you and just use <laughs> a little, all coordinated and so sometimes you want one of those but you don't want all of them so it, it does they do sell a lot of fabric to these things it's my co coffee mug that says fat quarters are not a body part and then they have uh they have a layer cake and this is uh, i love these layer cakes now this one i got because it makes sometimes little backgrounds or things you can use either side you see what a difference that is and uh, uh, so it, eventually you all use all of those and basically patchwork is well patchwork came about because people were patching holes in things and they used uh, leftover fabric to do patchwork so some quilts are made just of scraps patched together and what is sashing? Sashing is 
like you can you get here and you need something between these squares that and so you put a piece of fabric down just to separate the squares from one another and it, it adds to the design and then there's a stitch in the ditch a stitch <laughs> in the ditch well that's when two seams come together and instead of quilting on top you just stitch in and on top of where the seam comes together. That's stitch in the ditch. That sounds like an easy way to it's do it. It's much easier. You have, at least you have a guide instead of just going all helter-skelter. Oh, okay. And um, I have more here. What is a walking foot? <laughs> okay, that it belongs to your sewing machine. And when you sew three layers like this, you know, the bat topping, the bat slide. backing, and the batting, it, it bunches all up. So the, they've made a foot that you can use on your sewing machine that has a, a walking, it makes it two levels will move together. And a crazy quilt? That's <laughs> what Vanda does, <laughs> you know, parts. It's, uh, Taking scraps and just you don't care counter. what color, you don't care what shape, and just sewing them together. And if they're irregular shapes, uh, you just make a straight line and cut off the part you don't want. <laughs> and so it's just, uh, yeah, it's just a whole bunch of fabrics. Helter skelter. Yeah. Hi, Marilyn. It's so good to have you here at Okamuk. How did you get involved in quilting to begin with in your life? I had always admired quilts and I knew while I was working, I would not have time, the time to devote to quilting that I knew it would need. So I made up my mind that when I retired, I was going to begin quilting. And right before I gave my retirement notice, I signed up for a quilting class. I didn't tell my co-workers that the quilting class was actually during the day. It was a beginning quilting class. I didn't tell them I was leaving yet. So that's how I got into quilting. 13 years old, I started making my own clothes. My sister and I used to fight over the machines and we'd go home from college to see who was gonna get to make, you know, the new clothes for the next session. Well, when my husband-to-be asked me what kind of engagement ring I would like. I said, I don't want an engagement ring. I just want a plain old carved wedding band. And I said, what I would really like is a sewing machine. <laughs> so my engagement ring was a sewing machine. I was still in college and came in very handy because I didn't have to fight with my sister anymore. <laughs> Tell us about your son, who is the famous photographer. He's been very good about coming to take pictures and he gets quite enthusiastic about getting them all done. He'd come to the sewing room <clears throat> and we, he'd put the, the quilt on the floor and get up on a step ladder and take the picture of it. Sitting in front of you right here is a gorgeous quilt. Tell us about it. Okay, this is the dragonflies. And this is a technique called raw edge applique. Most applique that you, you see has the edges turned under. Raw edge applique, there's no, it's all raw edges. There's no turned down, fa turned over fabric. And when you say raw edge, you mean R-A-W edge? Yes. And you use a product called Fusible Whip. And it can come in sheets like this, or it can come on a roll. This happens to be steamer seam too. And it, and, and this comes in sheets. I do use one, in fact, on, on this quilt, I used heat and bond because I needed so much of it, I had to have it on a roll. And the way, the way Fusible Web with the two papers go, you can actually, you rip off the one paper and you fuse it onto the back of a fabric, not on the front, but on the back. And I have a, very small sample here. I, this is the front of the fabric. I fused it onto the back and I drew a design. I drew a leaf. And you, 
imagine this is a large piece of fabric and this is just one element. You put your piece on top of it, you press it on with an iron, and I happen to use invisible thread. Here it is, there's a couple of layers of it here, probably can't see it. But I use invisible thread on this a lot so that it doesn't, it doesn't detract from what you're doing and if I make a mistake, you can't see it. Now what so, are you using the thread to do? I'm using the thread to hold down, even though the piece is fused, it has to be so. So I use it to hold down the piece and I use, usually use a blind hem stitch on this. So at least just pieces catch. On the sewing machine. On the sewing machine. All, the, all, the, all this is done on the sewing machine. Now how do you get the black in there? Okay. With, with this piece, I actually had a couple of yards of black fabric. I fused onto the back of the black. I put the fusible. Then I turned it over and on the paper I drew all of the dragonflies on this. So you have a whole pattern of every one of the dragonflies. Cut them out, did not take the paper off yet because I then had to construct each one of the dragonflies. And the, most of the fabric that are in the dragonfly is called batik. The batik fabric is a very uh, more, more heavily woven than, than regular fabric. So it does not, it does not fray as easily as, as other fabric does. So I kind of had picked my fabric out ahead of time on where I wanted the different elements. And again, on the back of the fabric, I fused the different pieces, drew out each of the pieces, and then cut them out, had to turn them over. I would take the paper off, lay them out onto the wings and the body and fuse it on. So that's how I constructed each of the dragonflies. So in which, when you put the pieces on there, you left some black visible. Absolutely. So that's why it looks like stained, stained glass. glass. That's right. The pieces are a little smaller and, it, and I did use a pattern on this. So, so uh, yes, you leave the space so that the black shows through and you get the stained glass effect. Marvelous. Then it was arranging the dragonflies. This is the background fabric. Now quilts have three layers. This is the background. There's batting in between. And then there's the backing. So I laid all these on the background fabric and finally got it set up. And then I had to press them all. I would take the paper off at the backs of the dragonflies and that and press them all down. Then again, with invisible thread and sewed around the whole dragonfly and each, each of the dragonflies. Then it came time to quilt the quilt. You layer it, you quilt it. I again, and I used to use this a lot, is I used invisible thread on the top. So while it doesn't show, and you may, it doesn't show, but you can see when it's hanging, you can see the elements radiating from the center of the quilt. So that is one way of doing stained glass. You've got another one? Yes, I do. Again, stained glass, but a different technique. This stained glass, again, is done with fusible, fusible web. And same thing, you cut out your individual pieces lay it out on your background fabric here. But instead of having black background underneath it, there's a product called Clover, Clover Fusible Bias Tape. And you buy it on a roll and it, you actually fuse it down on the outside of your edges. And you've gotta be careful uh, how you do your corners and 
to make sure and also make sure that you don't have any of the bias showing at the end how you end your pieces there. But there again, this is this is stained glass, and uh, it's uh, it's beautiful. Which of the two is easier to do? In a way, that in a way, the dragonflies is easier because. Uh, this is very hard sometimes to get all of your edges covered and make sure you don't have any raw seams from your bias tape sticking out. So actually, the, the, the one on the black background is a little easier because I can manipulate the... And it can be a little crooked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is perfect. This is beautiful. You know, quilting reminds me of an experience I had in China the year we were over there teaching. Hutch was working with this young lady who had come in to have her paper um, edited. And I was working a, a jigsaw puzzle. And as she left, she walked by the table and saw me working on this thing. And she said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm putting this puzzle together. And she looked puzzled. And I explained, I said, it was, it's a picture. And I showed her the box. I said it was mounted on this heavy paper or cardboard and cut into little pieces and then taken all apart and now I'm putting it back together again. She had this astonished look on her face and she said, isn't that a waste of your time? <laughs> so I compared it to quilting where people take perfectly good large pieces of fabric cut it into these pieces, and then put it back together again into something that's useful. And, um, and beautiful. And beautiful, yeah. That's the important part. This is My Geraldine. I label her My Geraldine because the original Geraldine was made by a quilter called Pam Holland, and this is her pattern. But this is my version of her Geraldine, <laughs> so this is my Geraldine. And Again, same technique with raw edge applique, where you use the fusible web and put your pieces down. However, in this case, instead of hiding the stitches, I actually used the stitches to enhance the quilt and to decorate the quilt. Another thing I did was I used a permanent black pen, uh, and this is a fabric pen, to draw her eyebrows and to do highlight her eyes and a little highlight, little gray uh, on the white there to highlight her eyes. Uh, it's uh, just another technique to, uh, to enhance your quilt. And then I used the black thread around all of the pieces, did a little little more little black thread a uh, bit little black uh, marker there kind of shaded in give it a little shading and uh so the and and this actually be became part of the quilting because i had layered the quilt before i did any of the stitching so the stitching beca became part of the quilting and uh and i just quilted the background <laughs> so so this is my geraldine when a non-quilter hears quilt, this is the type of quilt that people envision, uh, which is a traditional piece quilt. I had fun doing this type too. <laughs> this quilt has been judged, and uh, judging is uh, an interesting process. They, uh, there are the judges that my quilt build used were certified judges. Uh, there were. National Association of Quilt Judges, and they have to go through a whole program to become certified. Only light quilts are judged together. This was in large piece uh, traditional quilting, so it was only large piece quilting quilts that were in that category. This quilt did win the blue ribbon in the category of large traditional piece. Yes, I was very surprised. I usually make big quilts, like king size and queen size, but today I bought, brought just a couple of smaller ones. This one just has some hearts on it. 
and of course we have to have gators and there's nothing like making gator teeth i mean this can make you crazy in a short time <laughs> and had it not been for the rotary cutter i would never have begun quilting because you just cannot cut with scissors and do an accurate job you just can't do it and the rotary cutter is just amazing this one has a lot of different quilt patterns you can see there are 12 there and this is what you would call a sampler quilt Amanda, you do a variety of styles yes. of quilts. Yes. Tell us about them. Okay. <clears throat> this particular one, this is a small wall hanging, and it happens to be hand work. This is hand applique. It's done with obviously little pieces of fabric, and it's with a technique called needle turn. And that's because you turn the edges under using the needle and make little tiny stitches to attach the fabric and make the picture. This. And often a guild will have a challenge for their members and it's a way to get people involved and have them do a similar project but with their own style. And this one was called, you were supposed to use the theme of um, sentimental journey something in time and you had to use five different skills or technique oh here we go again this is from a book that told you how to make some of the parts it's supposed to look like a cabinet in your home with your books your flower your arrangement your picture whatever you would have on your bookshelf in your family room. The pillow is something known as Hawaiian applique, and they would make applique with one big design. And the pillow is a much smaller version. I mean, the real Hawaiian quilts take a design like that and make it into the whole quilt top. Yeah. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Or you can make lots of different squares like that and put them together to make the top. And then this quilt, I had looked in all the drawers in the sewing room and they have so much stuff, zippers and buttons. And so I just said I should try to use that. I was gonna do all zippers, but one of the quilters mentioned fidget quilts. They're quilts for people with Alzheimer's or other kinds of dementia who are always fidgeting. So I've got zippers and squeaky toys and buttons and bells, keys, so they can sit and have something to play with with their hands. Well, this one you can hook and unhook. It's nice. Good. My cats really enjoyed it before I <laughs> turned it in. This piece is Velcro. There's keys, buttons, bells. This you can slide that piece back and forth. That's from an old swimming suit. <laughs> Okay, that's really fun. Have have you given something like this to anybody at this Not point? Not yet. Oh, so it'll be fun to see reactions. I made one quote before this that I did give away. It was called tie-dye pie in the sky. It was all tie-dyed round circles like pies with buttons and things. And I gave it to a family with little kids because the kids like playing with all the things. And my latest quilt, they had this fabric with cats. So this is called the cat sextet. Ah, three on the top and three, three on, on the, the bottom. bottom. They said, well, you know, Marilyn, you're going to have to find names for these. You have to name them all. That's the most difficult part. So these are 190 some names of the 190 some quilts you personally right. created. Right. 
Why don't you read us some of your favorite names? Well, there was a Gator Gridiron. Some of these I can still picture in my mind. Um, mixed Greens, Cayenne and Curry, Fifty Shades of Green, Leopards Lurking, oh. Cream Sickle, Pinky Keen, Butterscotch and Chocolate, Yellow Brick Crossroads, I can still picture that one, Garden of Weeding, Sea Fever, Blue Days, Rhapsody in Blue, W-R-A-P, Rhapsody, <laughs> Ring Around the Rosies, Marooned, Golden Days, D-A-Z-E. Well, this one with dragonflies all over it is gonna be called, Have You Ever Seen a Dragonfly? In your hundredth year. In my hundredth year. Clark <laughs> says, you're in your hundredth year, mother. <laughs> Why do you quilt? It's mostly to have something to do. My husband died soon after I moved in, so I've had a lot of time on my hands and I can always come and quilt. Even in the middle of the night, I know the security people <laughs> and I sit in the sewing room. It's, it's really a comfort. Anne and Pat, you are the women who started the whole idea of the lap quilts. What are the reactions of people? I, I'm amazed at... They're blown away, you know. <laughs> The, particularly the people from, not from Okama, because now Okama people Expected. know that they get one, but they just can't believe it. And they try to pay us, you know, and say, no, no, no. And it, 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 they just, I tell them, it says it's the only thing you don't have to pay for here. <laughs> they, they are so appreciative. I've taken the quilts down to the skilled nursing a few times and seeing the expressions on people's faces. I try to make some that are more masculine because it's hard to, uh, you know, find. It's so many of them are florals and things like that. This one is all plaids and I think it's very masculine. But every now and then a male patient in skilled nursing throws us a curve. One guy took a very floral pink one and we questioned, you know, and he said, well, I want to take it home to my wife when I'm through here. So he was thinking of her and what she would like rather than himself, which I thought was nice. And some of them don't, I guess, don't have many visitors. So they want to talk. Pat's better at talking to him than I am. I'm, I'm you know, get it and get out of there faster. But they want to talk to you. They, they've tried to pay us for them. But the worst, the hardest, I think, is when we would go in with like six on each, on each of us would have six, and a husband and wife would be there and trying to decide. Yes, <laughs> right. And without a doubt, the husband defer, refers to the wife. She is the one that has to make the decision. Yeah. Even or if he's a in grandchild, bed. if that has to be a grandchild, they get first choice. And, and the CNAs and the nurses back there, too. When we come there, they will say encouraging things like how much the quilt perks up the room and makes the room look better and, mm -hmm. and how happy it looks. Yeah. But they are, they're just, they're so appreciative and it's like just a little touch of love. We were grateful to, to have it. Um, we appreciated the idea. And, uh, and over the next two or three days, we really studied it. When I was really down and felt fragile to, think, to know that somebody was thinking of me over there was very heartwarming. It gave me a sense of uh, Okemic as a community and a family and it made me feel that loved. And it meant a lot to me. It's beautiful. It has butterflies on it and I've and this was several years ago but I still have it and I, I use it to cover my legs when I take a nap. <laughs> and then came one of the residents, a quilter, with a quilt that she personally had made especially for me. And I was touched and I thought, well, I'm never gonna use this. It wasn't that large, but you know, it kept my feet warm. It was wonderful. This is the quilt that was given to Buddy. This was my own and I'm not sharing it. And it is absolutely beautiful. A Jacobian tree. 
To me, it meant that someone cared. And now, 10, 11 years later, I still look at it and think someone cared. It's really saved me the last few months to have that to do. And we're happy doing this and we're, we're thrilled that we have the lovely people helping make quilts. I never get bored. I usually work on two or three projects at a time and they're all different techniques. And I would catch myself when I'd be out for a walk stopping by here and checking on how many orphans needed adoption. It cheers people up. I want to play with the fabric and put my own choices together. This was a lifesaver for me. All right, we return, and I believe we're going to have a panel of some of our quilters come up here in the Oak Room. If you have questions, uh, just raise your hand. I'll bring you a microphone so we can all hear. Once our stars get in place, the stars are aligning. I think they deserve a great hand for what they did. Thank you. I hope you all on Zoom enjoyed that as much as I did. I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, so our quilters up here at our table have a microphone. So if, if there are questions, Dick Martin here in our Oak Room will field them. And quilters, remember to speak directly into the microphone when you answer. And of course, we have our Zoom okay. audience here. Thank you for being with us. So if there are any questions or comments at this time, we'd love for you to share them. Well, I have to say I enjoyed this 100%. It was wonderful. If there's anything I ever tried and hated was quilting. So I'm, <laughs> but you gals just made it look wonderful. Enjoyed it 100%. Well, come on down and join us. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Mary Sue Koppel got bit by the quilt bug doing all the interviewing. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful program. And for the first time ever, I want to go to the health pavilion. <laughs> anyone online, anyone here in our Zoom audience have any questions or comments? I think we're just so impressed. Well, for all of you here, if you if you want to go up and examine these more closely and talk one on one, feel feel uh, feel free to do so. Any quilters up there? You have your microphones. Do you have any comments that you'd like to make? Or <laughs> their talent is in I their just, hands. <laughs> go ahead, Miss Crosby. I just want to say thank you for Dick to Dick and. Uh, Mary Sue for all the work they have put into this program. Absolutely. I, I would like to add that uh, the quilting has been a wonderful addition to my life and a very creative thing to do and uh, a lot very easy. We do have a comment here on chat quilters. It says, do you have meetings when we're not in pandemic and can outsiders join? Outsiders, uh, I, you mean people who do not in town. live at, um, I don't know, we would have to talk about that because we consider this an OCAMIC project, uh, but uh, okay, we do meet uh, whenever we're allowed to. <laughs> So we'll talk about that. 
Thank you. Aren't there quilt gills in town, various places? Uh, uh, once the, the the red flag goes up that we can have more people and more activities. There is a quilt tail guild in town that plans to have its monthly meetings here. They did a few times before COVID came along and it'll be a wonderful opportunity to learn how to do more. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Um, like they indicated in the program, you don't have to be a quilter to come and join the group. If you can um, sort out squares and color combinations or man an ironing board and press seams, all of these jobs are available. You don't have to be able to sew or quilt to do some of the jobs there. And it's a fun group. Um, there's a lot of chit chat going on. And as it took me a long time to get the uh, vocabulary straightened out, like sandwiching and uh, things like that, it, it's, uh, there's no language barrier anymore. <laughs> <laughs> there is uh, one more thing that we've mentioned several times that there's fabric in the needle arts room. We welcome, if you moved in here with fabric that you thought you were going to use and you found you don't do that anymore or, uh, bring it on donate it that's what we use is fabric donated or people like me who have your own stash <laughs> so uh, yeah would anyone like to talk about how we down in our commons hallway we have our displays and often you change out the displays to share a theme or or um, some of our current displays that are down there? Yeah, uh, Ann Bonus does that, and uh, Doris Green does that. They, they work together. And if anybody has an idea for a theme, let us know, and we'd be happy to do it. But yeah, they, they're coming down and look, because they change it ever so often. I love our George Lewis display down there right now. Dale Williams, would you like to go ahead? I would because um, when I, I didn't know what to expect from the quilting group there, but I thought about the quilts that my aunt had and um, I, I guess a cousin may have gotten, I bet she had over two or 300 years worth of um, quilt, beautiful quilt that was made way back. And um, a friend and I had been discussing quilts for quite some time because there's a woman in Alachua that makes them. And um, she purchased one that was just so beautiful and she encouraged someone else. And that has redrawn me to quilting. And um, a friend that I grew up with, her grandmother had a quilting party for her when she turned 18 years old. And it, it, I have a, I was telling this friend in Vermont about this class today. And so I'm kind of in awe with what is going on. And I'm in awe with the women I have heard of in Alabama, seeing documents. Um, there's a Joe Cunningham, a male quilter. There's, um, there was one guy who was a quilter at um, Howard University who has since passed away, but it has become uh, a little interesting to me right now. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank I'd you. like to share something. I was in, uh, this is Diane Haynes. I was in skilled nursing eight and a half years ago for a very serious back operation. And I have with me right here my quilt. Oh, it's that beautiful. I received, which was signed by Ann Carlson. And it's Hi, called Anne, Home Diane, Sweet Home. The, the quilters are trying to see it. Hold it up again. Ann should re remember this one probably. So it, it has four different um, scenes on it. And of course, the back. Or the front. And I have my cat with me right here, Alfie, whom some of you know. And he loves this quilt. We fight over it. <laughs> so thank you all. It's been with me for a long time, and I hope it stays with me for even longer. 
Barb on Zoom, I see that you've made a couple comments about Quilting Group and Micanopy. Did you have a comment also you wanted to share? Uh, sure. Uh, we have a, an in-person quilting group in Micanopy if there's some people who are not in Oak Hammock. And we might actually have some cloth that uh, from time to time that I could donate for, we could donate for the, um, for the people in, uh, in the nursing. But additionally, if there's other people online here who are not part of Oak Hammock, we, we meet on Friday from about nine to two. We are distanced and masked and, um, and people are welcome to come and you can find it online under Micanope on Facebook, Micanope uh, Quilters and Crafters. This is what ILR is all about. I think sharing the interest and the talent. Great job. Any other questions? Well, I can't wait till the day that our town people can come in and share some of the beauty of this, but we'll go ahead and end now. We thank you for being with us and everyone here, you're welcome to come up and, and enjoy looking at the quilts. Have a great day, everyone.